there's a special birthday announcement in the squad. His birthday is on Sunday. Fernando, um, out of, I believe, Northern California. Tracy, California, yes, Northern California. So shout out to Fern. Big Fern's holding it down. He'll be turning 12 on Sunday, and he's fired up. He's been here every single day in the class. I think last week he came with a full uni and catcher's gear too. He actually was on the, the picture with the baseball school picture. So the dude freaking was, was balling out. He looked good. Boy. So happy birthday to Fern. You guys get a minute. Wish him a happy birthday. Shout him out on social media, whatever you got to do. Pump him up a little bit. Um, I didn't wear a jersey, but I got my hard hat. And all I do is rake, so that's what we do out here. We <laughs> home runs. We don't play defense. Uh, so just had to throw that in there, too. But um, we got another special guest on here, JC. And JC, I'll, I'll let Jake and Adam introduce you here in a minute. But thanks for popping on, man. You're going to be talking some outfield today. Today we're working on that outfield um, session as far as this week, wrapping up this week of defense. And then next week we'll be going into strength and conditioning, how to take care of your body, how to get, uh, enhance your mobility, how to do some Jager bands and all that good stuff, and, and really just perform at your highest level on and off the field. Um, so all this stuff is very important, and this is another important day. We never know. Maybe if we're a, an all-time shortstop, or that's all we do is play infield, we may get moved to the outfield at one point. And, yes, a lot of the times you just say, hey, put the dude in the outfield just to catch the baseball. Go play fetch, go run, go catch the ball. Well, guess what? Outfield, there is some strategies that we can use out there and some different mentalities that we can take. And I know we'll get into that today. And it's important. Every position on the field is important to win ball games. So I just want to throw that out there. If you don't play outfield or if you strictly pitch or strictly play first, you may play outfield at some point in your career. Don't be surprised. People move around. Ronnie played every position. Nick played every position. So you never know where you can play on the field, wherever you can add value. And like Adam said before, if you hit, you're probably going to be in the lineup. So if you can hit, you may get moved to the outfield just because there's somebody else better defensively in the infield. You got to be ready for your opportunities because if you're a liability in the outfield, then you're not going to be able to play. So just wanted to throw that in there. Um, Adam and, and Jake, I'll let you guys introduce JC. JC, once again, appreciate you hopping on, man. I'm excited to hear what you have to say and uh, let's get this baby rolling. All right. Well, we're excited to have Justin. Justin is one of our instructors at X Trainings Indy South, um, where we're located in Indianapolis. He does a ton of hitting stuff as well as outfield training. Um, actually, the scenario that Austin just talked through of being an infielder um, and being moved to the outfield is exactly the route that he took that he can probably talk to you guys a little bit more about. But um, I'm going to give him the intro he deserves here and show a quick oh, video. Yes. And right now, right now, he's worried about which video it is because, because <laughs> in our midst today, <laughs> in our midst today, we have somebody in Justin who has been on both top ten and not top ten. So we'll see which one we uh, we share. A feat LeBron is not done, so I'll take it. All right. So this is this is uh, against Austin P. What's the score here, JC? Walk us through the situation. Uh, I believe we're uh, we got we got hot right off the bat. This was a clincher. If we if we won this game, we were going to Tallahassee. We knew that going in, so we wanted to really set the tone early. I think we went up 3-0, 2-0, something like that. Had a hot first inning, and then uh, like you said, usually pitchers when they sit on the bench for a long time, they get a little cold and rusty themselves. So uh, yeah, I was just you know just feeling it out. I had to make a play, and well, here we have it. They're up 3-0. <laughs> Woo! Oh. Would have tied the game instead. Double play. And they're out of that. So I, I've talked to Justin about this play numerous times. And the one thing I'll say about it to introduce him here is, um, you know, the catch is awesome. Everybody sees the catch. But if you notice the wherewithal that he had to get the ball in quickly um, is what was really impressive. So situational baseball, understanding what to do and where to go with the ball. Um, is huge. So I'm excited to have Justin. He's a good friend, um, and uh, we're excited to have him on here. He knows way more about outfield than than I do, and uh, he's heard me say, you don't have to teach a dog to fetch, <laughs> just like you don't have to teach an outfielder to catch way too many times. So I'm glad he's here, and you all don't have to listen to me for the hour, but that's uh, a little bit about Justin for you. Yeah, good to be here, guys. Uh, like I said, um, being an outfielder is not the worst thing. Like I said, everyone wants to be the shortstop. Everyone wants to be the pitcher. Everyone wants to be the catcher. But every nine, all the nine positions are important in, in baseball. That's why they have them. All right. If it wasn't the case, we'd have eight, seven, six guys. But no, we have nine. All right. So every every position is as important as the next. All right. And don't feel discouraged if a coach has to push you back. 
or calls you in or sits you on the bench or all that stuff. Every position matters, okay? It's a team game for a reason. Um, with that being said, outfielders make it look easy, but as you know, my friend Kyle can make it also look very hard out there. But uh, like I said, he can swing it. Yeah, he can swing it, so that's why they put him out there. Um, there's a lot of drills or a lot of technique that goes involved. Speed does help, but most importantly is the technique and the IQ and situational fielding. As there's situ situational hitting, there's also situational fielding. And how infielders get their prep steps and get in a good position before the ball's pitch, outfielders do the same. You may not see it because the camera's not on us, but we all do it out there. All right, if we're all doing it together, then you increase your range, increase the defense without even moving. And that's huge, all right? It makes it a lot harder for hitters to get base hits. It's frustrating for them, and then everyone else on our team gets up because we know we're taking away hits. And then that team goes down because they're getting hits taken away. So it's a lot of mental besides the physical aspect of outfielding. And like I said, I'm here for Q&A or anything else you want me to do to discuss the, that craft. Yeah, well, you, uh, J Justin, you mentioned uh, at the beginning there that all the positions are important, right? Yes. Um, at what point did you know that you were going to be an outfielder? Like, you know, I'm sure like everybody else, people – most people gravitate towards shortstop, towards pitcher, towards something else like that. You know, knowing – I don't know how many – a ton of people that really want to be a, an outfielder right off. So when did you know that that was going to be your position and uh, when you realized you could dominate it? Uh, I don't know. I was faster than everyone. I kind of had a hunch. But, uh, no, uh, I was playing rec ball my whole life. And then when 13, 14 came, uh, I, was allowed, I was allowed to play travel ball. Because growing up, I was asked to play a travel ball at early age because I was pretty good. But my dad's like, if you start something, you finish it. So we went from, I think, nine or eight years old to 13, played rec ball. Then after that, I had a lot of suitors, and then we picked a team. Now, when I went to the team, I assumed I would play, you know, shortstop because I was a shortstop for rec league. And uh, I was pretty good, but there was all shortstops there, and we're all pretty good. So then the coach was, like, talking to me. I got some games in, did really well, but he saw that we were struggling in the outfield. All right, we were winning games, but we were winning games, like, one to two, two zero, like four or five. They're close. They shouldn't be. So then one day he just had me try out for center field. And I wasn't good at first, but we just practiced, practiced, practiced every day, every day. And then I got pretty good. So he told me that why I have a great infield, like for you, have a great infielder when you could be a good or become great outfielder and then we still have a good shortstop. So I was like, all right. He's like, you want to win? I'm like, of course, that's all I want to do. Hmm. So I – did that, I took the team approach instead of me, we over me, and it worked out for me. Um, so after I made that transition, I just really focused on being the best I could at the position because I knew if I was good at center field, then I could tell my left fielder how to play, I could tell my right fielder how to play. Instead of me being a great center fielder, we can now have a great outfield. There's three of us out there. And then that infielder kept working, and then he made – You have them say, like, hey, by you being a great athlete and you being a great in person helping us, but your athleticism can make you a great outfield, make us a great outfield team, and then we can still have our good shortstops that can't play outfield. And when I took that approach, uh, it just, you know, took off, and I really just focused on my craft after that, and I really loved the outfield. Like I said, I watched the Braves game growing up. Andrew Jones is my favorite player ever, center fielder, stud, and I just watched him religiously on TV, like the routes he took, the how effortless it made, and I just practiced and practiced to try to be like him. And, like, when I saw it was working, the stuff he was doing, then I just – it just, yeah, it just took off. Yeah, and I think that's a, a big deal, guys. We talked about earlier – I think it was in the very first week when we are talking about mindset and, you know, you know, accepting roles on teams. And if your coach, you know, that they, you know ha says the team has a need, the quickest way to get into the lineup on a regular basis is to fill that need and fill it well. And that's, that's what Justin did. I know we've had players in the past that have – you know, we've been honest with them and told them, you know, hey, the money you're going to make or, you know, uh, your best chance to, you know, get into the lineup on a regular basis is in this spot. You know, I, I get the idea of being competitive and wanting to play the spot that you want to play. But I think for the most part, coaches have your best intentions, uh, their best intentions at heart and your uh, the best things in mind for you. So, you know, listen to what they have to say as far as that. Justin could have had a bad attitude about it and said, oh, I'm going to I'm going to
you know, battle for that. And you, know, you lost hot and not not did a good a big solution for their team. But look where it kept, look where it kept him, uh, got him. You know, he got to play at one of the, the biggest schools, uh, you know, in the Big Ten. You know, um, go out there and do some successful things. And it's because he had a good mindset about it, and he took a spot that was open and went out and won it, and didn't let anybody else take it. And I think that's a big deal. So, um, what do you think is uh, the best thing? Oh, go ahead, Austin. You're good. Yeah, no, I was just saying, huge, man. I want to just talk a little about you. Talk about the mentality aspect, Justin, and mm -hmm. uh, as an, of an outfielder and being ready for the baseball. Um, we had a, one of the coaches in here, and his son plays in Little League this year, and um, his name's Randy out in the North Bay, North Bay area, and <clears throat> amazing people. And he mentioned the no-fly zone. Outfield is a no-fly zone. You've got to earn your 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 role in the no-fly zone. So that right there just painted a picture for me, like, oh, I got to earn my role in the no-fly zone. Hey, that gives me something to play for rather than coach put me in right field because I'm the worst player. Like, I think the mentality goes into it. So when you're getting there, you talked about prep step. Like, what is your mentality to get ready for a fly ball? Like, what's your routine? What are you thinking? Um, depending on situations, like, just say an average situation, average hitter. What are you thinking in the outfield? Right, like I said, playing the infield definitely helped me uh, because, like I said, as an infielder, you're always used to anticipating where a ball's going to hit or just knowing the lineup from top to bottom, what he did last time, what he's going to do. Um, also, in the infield, you get a better look at the pitches and where they're uh, going and located. Um, so as an outfielder, you don't get that luxury, but you can still see where the catcher's located and the strike zone all that that day and uh, how the guy was hitting. And uh, you have to know your pitcher as well. There's a lot of stuff that goes to the baseball uh, especially the defensive part. And just by knowing your players, your pitchers, and watching what they've been doing that day or in the season helps you out. And then seeing the catcher, they're going in, out, up, down. you got to move accordingly. Now let's say – so Kyle Schroeder, my teammate, let's say he's up to the plate. I'm as a center fielder going to tell everyone let's go was pull side, all right, because he could beat us in the gaps or over the fence, but he's not going to beat us on a blooper down third base line. You know what I'm saying? So we're trying to maximize our ability to get him out. All right, we're not trying to prevent a hit, so to speak. We're just trying to maximize what he, our ability to get him out, what he does well, his strength, his power. So we're going to try to take that away from him. All right, so what I would do in that situation, 2-0 count, maybe overshift. Or if it's 0-2, maybe go a little normal, you know, basic. Um, never go the opposite unless I have a guy I know pumping that day. Um, but Kyle's a fastball hitter, so maybe I wouldn't do that. So like I said, there's a lot of factors you have to think in. But we'll say an average Joe Schmo hitter, I'd probably go straight up first inning, see what he does. Uh, next at bat, see what he does again. Then third, fourth at bat, I got him red. Um, by then I know my bullpen coming in or I know that pitcher, the starter is having a good day that day. And then uh, sometimes if it's two strikes, I'll tell my opposite guy, opposite hitter, excuse me, that if it's a lefty, I'll put the right fielder and vice versa. I'll tell them to cheat in, to take away that slap, slap hit, you know, a defensive swing. By me saying that, he has confidence that he can get everything because I'm telling him to go in. So as a center fielder, I'm going to cheat a little to his side because I know he can't go back as far. His range is limited because I'm telling him to go in and take away something. So by me doing that, I now have to be ready to get his back, so to speak, that, that gap. All right? But I don't move the opposite guy. I say everyone's the same except for now. I know I have to get a little more giddy up when it goes that ball, if it goes his way. But if it doesn't, I've already taken away, like I said, I'm maximizing our ability to get out. Taking away the defensive hit, taking away the slap hit, taking away the foul ball that usually wasn't caught. So just stuff like that, you got to maximize your range. Now, if I have a fast outfitter where all a bunch of me's out there, that would be awesome because now I can move everyone or we can play back a little farther to get the home run ball. All right? Because now usually balls over the fence you think are, are home runs. But if everyone can get to the wall and everyone can jump and everyone can catch, then we can – Get, play that home run ball, all right? But if I have a slow guy, I may have to tell him to scoot in, to kick away the short stuff. And again, like that, you got to know your outfitters, know your pitchers. So it's a lot of mind games, a lot of knowing this, uh, your own players and their players. So sky reports are very huge and important. And you'll get those down the line when you play college and higher level baseball because their job is to make sure they have an accurate sky report. If they don't have an accurate sky report, you let them know in the dugout, like, hey, coach, you said he's a fastball hitter. He hit that curveball 4,000 feet. What's up with that? Or, hey, you said he wasn't a slap hitter, and he slaps the ball every time. So there's accountability both ways with coaches and players. And like I said, you do it respectfully, of course. But like I said, it could get heated sometimes, but it's all because we want to win, and we have the desire to win. And I think uh, playing multiple sports has helped me well in baseball and playing infield and outfield because you have that athleticism 
and that's just ability to move that I feel like most kids don't get when they just play one sport. So even you don't have to be like a stud at any like other sport, but just really play a sport and keep you active so you can get that ability and that just natural feel to move your body. All right. Cause when you can move your body, you can play any sport. All right. We don't want a bunch of stiffs out there, no matter what sport you play. All right. If you're infield alpha, even catchers, like I said, you can be bigger than us, but you still got to move. Like I said, Schwarber was 240. He can still move. Like I said, just because don't limit yourself. All right. Cause I said, the more you can do, the better you'll be able to play this game and the more valuable you'll be to a coaching staff or a team or whatever it is you're doing. Versatility is huge. All right. And that's why I think you kids should do is just play as many sports as you can until you're limited. Because eventually everyone's going to play one sport. All right. And when you do, hopefully you've had the, the grassroots and foundation of just playing and being athletic, so to speak. So then you can excel at the one sport you choose later in life. I'm really happy that you hit on the multiple sports there. And sorry, Jake, I think you're about to hop in there. But I just wanted yeah, to – I, I love the multi-sport model because it teaches you to be an athlete. And, and Ronnie mm-hmm. says it all the time. It's, it's raining in my head. I've had dreams about it. Like, be an athlete, be an athlete, be an athlete. If we're athletes, we're going to be able to play. So that, that's a big point that I just want to reemphasize is, okay, play other sports. It's okay to focus on soccer for a season or some football or some – basketball or tennis I love tennis by the way tennis is freaking awesome I wish I played in high school but like you can do these different sports to help your body move in different ways to be more prepared once you do maybe stick to one sport further down the line um go ahead Jake yeah I was gonna say the same thing I think one big takeaway for a lot of you guys that you've heard throughout the entire three weeks that we've been doing this is be an athlete put yourself in an athletic position maximize your athleticism use your body and continue to develop yourself that way. Um, because that's just going to help you like be a healthy adult as well when you get to that point. So hopefully you get to play baseball forever. That'd be awesome. But at some point that runs out. And if you look at all of us that are, are talking, we're all still in decently athletic shape at this point, because that becomes a part of who you are as a person. And that just keeps you healthy in life. So that, that will take you farther than just baseball. But if you're an athletic person, like Justin was, right? He was able to transition relatively easy from infield to outfield. So the more athletic you are, like we talked about, the more positions you're able to play, the more valuable you are to a team or on the recruiting side of things too. So that's all great information. If I can just add one thing into that. Um, the one thing that we talked a lot about too is, is just the communication aspect. And the one thing that I liked that Justin said was that he was always communicating with the other outfielders to understand where they were supposed to be. And we've talked about it multiple times about you know, sometimes you're going to know something in the middle of the game that maybe your coaches don't see because they're doing a thousand other things. So communicating with the other guys next to you is such an important piece. And, and you have to take ownership of that and you have to trust yourself and your teammates whenever they do move you so that whenever they back you up a couple steps, or they move you in a couple steps, no matter what happens, that's information that we're trying to use based on what we've seen the other team do. So, so for instance, let's say Justin backs up five steps and a guy bloops a single right in front of him, that's fine because information has already told us that he's going to crush a ball over my head or I don't want to give up a double in this situation. So I think what I really liked about that was your communication piece and how you talk to the other outfielders a lot because some outfielders do have some limitations on what they can and can't do, and that's okay. But we're in the middle of competition. We're trying to, we're trying to use all of our strengths and figure out how we can just not – we don't want to let the ball hit the ground, right? Um, and, and the last piece I got for outfield is I say infielders. When we make mistakes as infielders, those are, those are minor uh, to, a, to an extent. But they're minor because most of the time we're only giving up one base, right? But I think outfielders are so valuable because anytime the ball hits the ground, especially if we're going back, I mean, that's, a two, ba- that's two bases right there. So I think outfielders are so incredibly valuable in that respect because when the ball's in the air, I mean, a lot of times they're, they're taking away the big plays of the game. Um, you know, and I, and I look at that play that you made, uh, the home run ball, how many outfielders would have just kind of let that go over the fence? But, you know, you're obviously going after that. You change the whole course of the game with that play right there. So I think for outfielders, they're taking big plays away. So for you guys that are out there, understand your role is, is not just making the ground ball out, but you're taking doubles and triples and home runs away from other people that are hitting the ball up there too. So I just wanted to add that in. Yes, you're right. Like you said, we're, the center fielder is like the quarterback of the, the outfield. Like yeah. you said, like you have to know a lot of things going on, just like the shortstop's the quarterback of the infield and the catcher and so on, so on, and so forth. Like I said, you have to communicate and you have to know what you're doing because you set everyone else up. Just like I said in football, like I said, the quarterback has to set everyone up. If, if you if you got a loss for your game, if you got sacked, okay, that's okay. Don't throw a pick, though. Like I said, if a blooper goes in front of me, 
okay, I didn't give the big play. And infielders get the routine plays. They got to make them routine. We know that. We cannot get low to sleep out there in the outfield picking daisies, okay? We're out there for a reason. We got to – we're momentum busters. We're momentum gainers. Like I said, when we make a play, it's a big play. Whether it's once, twice, three times a game, that once, twice, three times a game could change the game. And fortunately for us, I set the tone early and we didn't look back. And like I said, that could have gone over the wall and then who knows what happens. Or I could have caught it and showboated it and then we don't get the third out and then maybe they have a big inning after that. Like I said, you don't know what happens. So outfielders, you're not – you're not – don't think you're not important out there. All right? Like I said, going back, every nine positions are important. All right, so you don't know when it's going to be your time, but when it is your time, you have to shine. Okay. Wisdom nugget of the day. Hashtag wisdom nugget. When it's your time, <laughs> when it's your time, you got to shine. Let's go. <laughs> That's fire. That's fire. Um, Adam, did you have something to say? I think you were going before uh, Jake. My oh God, I don't remember what it was. I can't remember back that far. But no, just uh, what Justin was saying there. We we mentioned earlier in the uh, week that the low percentage plays are often the ones that shift the shift the game entirely or shift the momentum. You know, the ones that don't happen that often, but when they do, uh, like I said, it changes the game. And the outfielders have the capability of doing that every single game. Uh, Because oftentimes when the ball gets by you as an outfielder, what could have been only one bag or should have been zero bags often turns into extras. And like Justin said, you know, showboating there and not getting the ball in and not being able to get that third out, you never know um, what kind of an impact getting uh, runs with two outs will happen, what will have for you. So, you know, take pride in making the routine plays look routine and then take pride in the fact that you always have the opportunity as an outfielder or in any position to be the one that makes that low percentage play happen and shifting the tide of the game. That's a big deal. Love that. Um, but can you look a little bit more on the aspect of like, like the communication piece of how you can communicate in the gap? We had somebody mention a, a question to me about if I'm a center fielder and there's a ball in right center gap, who takes it, me or the right fielder? Well, I told them, hey, whoever gets there first, <laughs> whoever gets a better read on him gets there first, right? But yeah. how about the communication piece between your outfielders? You mentioned like, hey, knowing where they are at and like knowing what your speed is of your left fielder and your right fielder, maybe their skill set, maybe my left fielder is there just to hit and you got to have him a little shallow. But how important is that communication for these athletes to really think about when they're out there on the field? Yeah, before the communication occurs, you have to have the mindset. You have to have the mentality of being a ball hawk. You have to want the ball, all right? Because if you, want, if you don't want the ball, I can put you at DH. I can put you on the bench. I can hide you there. But if you're in the field, you have to want the ball. You have to want to be a ball hawk. And like I said, going back, you have to desire and have that ability, of course, but more the mentality to go get it. Because if you're playing scared, you're not going to do anything for us. All right? Like you said, we don't want you out there timid. I'd rather a guy go 100% and fail than go 50% and succeed. You know what I'm saying? Like I said, you have to go. You have to go to go. And being the center fielder, like I said, you have to go get the ball. Like going back to you said with your coach in from uh, California, the no fly zone, that's a mentality. Nothing drops out there. All right. We are going to get every ball that's hit out there. All right. We may not, we probably won't, but you have to have that mentality first. Cause if you don't, then you're not going to succeed. Like I said, a scared athlete is a waste of space. All right. I want confident guys out there, even though I know you're not as good as me or as good as Mike Trout or whoever it is. If you're confident, I can roll with you. You're my guy. At first, of course. Now, if the right fielder gets there first and you know you can get it, then you have the banana and hook behind him so in case he doesn't get it. But if you know he's not going to get there and you can get there, you have the community and say, ball, ball, my mind, whatever it is. We said my mind because it's letting you know that, again, it's a confidence thing. I'm getting it. I'm putting it out in the atmosphere and in my head that I'm getting it. It's mine. All right, but some people like ball. It's up to whoever your coach or your program decides to do. But, again, say it out loud, say it confidently, and then when you say it, go do it. Love it. I love what's that. Your, what, go ahead. Just, Justin, what's your take on, on diving plays? I know that you're the, you know, 100% failed rather than 50% right. succeed. But what, what's the mentality on diving plays? Because I know a lot of guys will, you know, hold up on a possible play instead of dive at it. I know for us, whenever I was in college, it was – if you're 100% aggressive and, and you happen to miss it, we're fine with it. We got guys that are behind you backing you up. But what, what was the mentality with you guys when you were playing? 
Right. That's a great question because you see that a lot, especially with the younger uh, age and lower levels that people really say they pull up. And then coaches are like, oh, what are they doing? Or even the pitchers are like, come on, man. But I get it. They don't want to mess up because if they mess up, they fear they're going to get in the bench and blah, blah, blah. So, great question. Um, um, first thing, if it's on the lines, never dive. Never dives on the lines because the risk is not worth the reward. Now, if it's foul, of course, let it, let it fly. All right? That's the first thing because you have no one to back you up on the lines. That's a long run for the center fielder. Okay? So, we'd rather give up a single than a double, triple, home run, you know, all that. We can fight to live another day, all that. But if – you're coming in 100% and you can get it, get it. Because like you say, you've been taught, you've been trained, you've been coached, hopefully, that your center fielder is supposed to back you up. Now, if he doesn't back you up and you dive and you see that ball roll to the wall, that's not on you, whoever dove, because you gave it 100%. You did your job. Now, again, the team part is what? All the nine have to work together. So that one weak link just caused the whole team to suffer. All right? That's why you can't be lazy. That's why you can't be self-involved. That's why you can't pout if you had a bad at bat the last time. You have to forget and move on. Baseball is short term, but in a long term atmosphere. All right. We have to think in the moment, but also forget and think forward. So, like you said, once you make that effort, you did your job, kid. Made it or not, it's okay. The center fielder has to back up always. That's why your center fielder has to be in good shape, has to be a good team player, has to be a good role model, has to be a good leader. Because if he's not leading, people aren't going to follow. So you got to lead by example out there along with uh, communicate. I love that. Hey, and so in the same regard, you know, what's your take on deciding whether or not to try to, um, you know, gun somebody out? You know what I mean? Try to get that guy, uh, to, to deciding whether or not you're going to try to throw somebody out at home when maybe there's like a trail runner behind him, behind, you know oh, what okay. I mean? Oh, good. good question. Um, like I said, know your skill set. If you have, we'll say – a pea shooter, don't throw anyone out. That's like a guy, that's like a, a guard in the NBA trying to block a center or block a shot, period. It's just not smart, all right? Again, the risk is not worth the reward. So if you have a hose, though, use your talents. Use what God's given you. Use what you've worked for, all right? So if you can throw that guy out, throw him out, all right? Now, don't sail it because, again, you could overthrow it. It could be errant throw, and they can move up bases. Throw through the head of the cutoff because then that puts you, your team in ability to what? cut throw, fake cut, all that, and freeze that lead runner, all right? Or maybe you scare the, the main runner that's trying to advance. And also, it puts the fear in the coach and other players, knowing that whenever balls hit to 99 or right field or wherever you are, they know there's a possibility of you getting out, all right? But that's another thing is if you get older and you take um, in and out, you have to show it off, so to speak. Show it off. So, therefore, it sets the tone that they're already conservative and they're already being passive in their game plan because they know that so-and-so, the ball's hit there, we're going to put the brakes. All right? So, yeah, I would recommend throwing the ball through every time you can. But be smart. you gotta hit, you got to hit the cutoff. I love that. Can you, can you talk a little bit about uh, the setup for that? You know, if you're going to put yourself in the best position possible to be able to throw a guy out, obviously that happens before you catch it. Like, so okay. your perspective, what's the best way to set for these, for these, young, these young players? Because I think when you're a young outfielder, your primary thought uh, is, like, I just got to catch things that I can catch. And then beyond that, there's not a ton of thought into <laughs> throwing guys out, you know, keeping things in front. So what's your mentality and your, the way that you would teach somebody to best set themselves up to be able to throw a guy out? Okay, there's two times you can throw a guy out. There's a guy, the ball on the ground, grounder, and a fly ball. So on fly balls, what you want to do is get behind the ball, so to speak. So what that means is, let's say the ball is always has to be in front of you. All right. So in order to get behind it, it has to be in front of you. So the ball has to be, we'll say, where you can look up at a 45 degree angle and the ball is right there. That's where you want to be. So therefore, you can create some momentum and move forward and catch it right there. Shorter height. What I try to teach all my outfitters is if the ball's above our shoulders, we got to catch it like this. If the ball's below our belt, we can catch it like that. Now, when the ball's above our shoulders, it should mean we're behind the ball. So when you're going through it, you got to really make sure you catch it right there up high so then you can bring it right to your throwing arm and make a good throw. Now, that's the upper body. The lower half is you got to get it going. So <clears throat> what I would recommend is, again, keep that ball right in front of you, 45-degree angle so you can see it. And then have your feet constantly moving, 
okay? So it's a little shuffle steps, all right, or gather steps, whatever you want to call it, but have left foot in front, right foot behind, and just slowly keep those things moving, all right? And then once you make that catch, you just do a quick crow hop, make the throw. And then on the ground, what you can do, um, this one's a little trickier, because you uh, right to you or to your right. So depending on your glove side. Um, so if the ball's right to you, it's the easiest one. Same thing as the fly ball, make sure you look it, but eyes down the whole time. Do not come up, because when your chin comes up, eyes come up, and that ball can go behind us so we can kick it. Just like an infielder has to look it through all the way, outfield has to do the same thing. But not like infield, we want to catch on the outside foot. All right, outsider foot, excuse me. All right, so wherever your glove side is, that foot, you got to catch it outside. We don't want it in between the legs, we want it outside. Outfield out, infield in. All right, then once you make that catch, go to your ear, right to your ear, make a throw. All right, if the ball's hit to your glove side away, you got to really make sure you run out there. All right, you ride your own run, 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 run. And once you catch it, you can spin and throw it. But if you can't spin and throw it, you got to get your butt around and make a throw. All right, and then the opposite, your throwing arm, that's like your backhand. That's the toughest. Really make sure, unless you have to cut it off in the gap or on the line and dive or whatever, really make sure you do it. Because, again, if you miss it, there's no one backing us up. There's only the wall. And that's a long walk there. All right. So, uh, yeah, that, that backhand one, just really bust your butt. That's all I can say. That's an effort play. I like that. I like that. I think it helps clear a lot of that stuff up for, for those guys. Um, I got a picture here I wanted to try to share that of a um, – and, guys, again, don't, uh, don't click on the screen. Don't draw on the screen. But I want to show you guys a picture of a way another coach talked about, decide, you know, being able to get momentum behind the ball. Um, Austin, can I share my screen? Is that cool? Yeah. Sure. Um, okay, we're good to go. Yeah. So, just uh, and Justin, you can tell us kind of what you think about this. I don't know if this is too more if this is more complicated for uh, younger guys or not. But uh, we went to the ABCA convention and I had a really good talk. I can't. I think this guy. I can't remember where this coach was from off the top of my head, but that shared this picture about gathering momentum. Um, you know, behind the baseball, and it's talking about. You know, if you're trying not to get any momentum behind the ball and you're just trying to catch it, you know, and, and not be working on that throw, it's, you know, trying to catch the bottom of the ball or looking at the bottom of the ball. Um, and then also if you're trying to get momentum uh, behind a throw, trying to catch the top of the ball or look at the top of the ball, kind of like that 45-degree angle thing you were talking about. But I thought this was a really good picture, at least for my mind, to help me help get that point across to be able to teach outfielders of what part of the ball to catch and what part of the ball to look at. Uh, when you're trying to, you know, either gain momentum versus not gain momentum. Yes, yeah, <clears throat> yes. <clears throat> that diagram is, is a good one. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because, like I said, if you're trying to make a throw, there's one out. You want to see the top of it. You want to get that 45-degree angle. You want to go through the baseball. But if there's two outs, you don't have to get behind it because you just got to make the play. Now, again, you should still be in a good position, kids. Don't drift and don't just lollygag towards it. All right. But again, yes, the bottom of the baseball is when you're just trying to make a catch and the top is when you're trying to make a play and make someone and throw someone out. I agree. That's awesome. I like that diagram a lot. And, and we had a question come in, um, which I think is a really good question. He says, as a baseball player, we should never be standing around or walking. Yes, thanks for reiterating that. Fires me up. Mm -hmm. On a ball down the line, so you can say either line, where am I supposed to be as a center fielder? So say, uh, let's just, I'll, I'll paint more of a picture. Schwarber's up to hit. You're playing center field. You already know that he kind of he pulls the ball, so you're probably shadow right center. He rips one down the right field okay. line. It gets to the fence. Where are you supposed to be on that play? Backing up, following? Like, what's your role? Like you said, <clears throat> like I commented before, we're always what? In motion. We're always moving. So, again, I know I'm not going to really affect the play, but I can still affect the play. So, ball's down the corner. I'm running towards that line and screaming whatever the cutoff because – he can't see the cutoff because he's running towards the ball. I can see the cutoff. And, again, when you play in bigger arenas, the stadiums, like, the, the noise is loud. They're cheering or whatever they are. So you have to get closer to him so you can let him know. So what I would do in that instance is I run down towards shallow right center – or, excuse me, right field, and I'm screaming cut two, cut two, or cut three, cut three. Or maybe he slipped out of the box and he's trying to stretch it into his double. I go two, two, two. So then my right fielder knows what to do before he touches the ball. And the infielder should already be lined up, all right? They don't have to say anything because you should already know where to go, and your center fielder should be yelling or telling and directing wherever your signals are 
where to throw the ball. So when that ball's hit down the line, I'm moving either right field or left field shallow and screaming right, pretty much almost right next to the, the cutoff man, but not next to him so I don't distract my outfielder. But I'm around that area so I can yell or I can even talk to him like, hey, I'll be like, hey, Basil, <clears throat> are, we, are we going? He's like, yeah, cut three, cut three. And I'll be like, hey, hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because outfitters, you're used to each other because you practice each other all the time. So they're going to hear my voice and boom, it's going to snap. Okay, I got to go here. I got to go there. And you practice that enough that you'll get used to it. So that's good. Like team chemistry and communication is huge. But yeah, I would just go to the outfield, left or right field, and just scream and yell, uh, cut two, cut three, two, 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 three, 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 all the way uh, while I'm looking at the play itself. Yeah, that's uh, I'm like the third eye for me. No, that's huge, Jason. That's huge. And I'm glad that you mentioned the communication piece because it's really, really easy for youth athletes, especially. And by youth, I mean anything less than college to right. not yell and talk if you're not involved in the play. Right. They get lost in spectating instead of actually participating. You're right. 100%. And just that little call of you being a center fielder and just saying, hey, three, three, three. Now that's that split second of no indecision rather than indecision now gets that guy at three rather than he's safe and now you lose the game on a walk-off squeeze. Right, and those, and those split seconds are huge because, again, like I said, the more you dibble, dabble, or whatever think, the more time that runner's not thinking. He's just running. That's what he's taught to do. But we have to do the same thing as fielders. We've got to be taught catch, go, catch, throw. And like I said, when the ball's in the corner and the ball's rolling, if they're hearing three, three, two, 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 or any direction at all, they're going to start moving faster. And like I said, baseball's a game of inches more than any sport. How many bang, bang plays can go either way because of it? So if we can increase our time and decrease the chances of them gaining ground on us, that's huge. Like I said, when I say three, 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 that outfielder should catch and go. Catch, go. He shouldn't catch it, then look and see where he has to throw. I'm already doing thinking for him, being the center fielder. Again, you're the quarterback. You're the coach. You're letting everyone know. Just like catchers can see the field, center fielders can see the field in the other way, the inverse way. So, like I said, by me helping out my team like that, just increases their chances of getting people out. That's what you want to do. That's huge. No, thanks for, for, for clarifying that, too, for us as well. And um, Bo, who asked the question, just asked, so essentially, were that guy's eyes? Yes, you are. You're the yes. eye. Uh, you are the eye. Yes. You got the best view in the, of the house. You got the best view. I love it. I love it. First class seat. Let's go. Um, oh, so it's the best. <laughs> Aiden asked, when being a ball hawk, is it possible to want the ball too much? And if so, what is the middle ground to wanting the ball and still being smart about the play? No, it's, there's, there's no such thing as wanting the ball too much. When, if you don't want the ball that much, I don't want you on the field at all. Um, but, yeah, there are times where you can um, take a back seat and let someone else catch it. Because just like you say, like another sport, like I say, if you're an athlete, you play most sports, and you pick up on things. If I can get to every ball and I get to every ball, then I will say I'm selfish or I'm being greedy. So maybe now in the eighth, seventh, sixth, uh, you guys play like six innings. So only like the third, fourth inning, my left fielder is not moving anymore because he's expecting me to get it. Or my right fielder is not moving anymore because he's, he's out of the game. They're out of the flow. Just like in basketball, if LeBron is scoring all the time, no one else is going to play, right? So like if I can get to the tough ones, I'm going to get them. If I know Schwarber can get to a fly high, a mile high fly ball, I'll let him get there. You know why? Because it gets him in the game. It gets him – you know, acclimate. It makes him feel he's part of something. He's, he's in rhythm now. And maybe it's a home run the next at bat. You know what I'm saying? So there's a lot of things you have to do in order to um, make the team function. It's not just black and white, like I catch the ball, I get the outs, we play baseball. It's more of like the personality side, where it's like if you know this guy needs a couple of these to get him going, let him get him going. Now, if you know he can't get there, then, of course, call him off. Just like if you know in basketball a guy needs two or three points to get him playing defense, give him two or three points, all right? Because his defense is going to help us win the game. Just like Schwarber's bad, whoever's playing up there, he's going to make us win the game. If the guy's getting no action or the one action he gets to makes an error, he doesn't have a chance to, you know, redeem himself, then he's going to struggle in the box. Baseball is a two, two-way game. It's not just we play defense or offense. It's not football. you got to always contribute, whether it's playing offense or playing defense. I feel like defense can create offense, just like offense can create defense. How many times have you seen a guy make a great play and the next inning hit a home run or a double? And then vice versa. That's, it's just baseball, man. It's a game of momentum. It's a game of rhythm. So if no one's in rhythm except for one guy, then the ball's not hit to that guy, then we're in trouble. So you got to work as a unit, and sometimes you have to take a back seat for the greater good, whether it's positional changes or just sacrificing another stat on your uh, assist or out.
put out. I love that. I absolutely love that. I love the fact of you, you saying that defense can sometimes create offense. It's so real. Make a diving play. Yeah. You go and you rake, you hit a bomb. You're like, let's See go. it too many times. It's, it's, it's hilarious at times. <laughs> Guy's never hit a home run in his life, made a backhand play, and then boom, hit a 500. It's like, what the <laughs> hell? <laughs> it's so true. But it's like, you see that, and you're like, okay, well, now that just shows how much that momentum can carry in to your yes. offensive production as a team which is, I think, is a key thing for these athletes to know. And I'm going to put that in the chat so that you guys have for your notes as well, that you can really look at that because you never know how you can add value to your team. And like you said, it's a team game. Everybody has a role no matter what you're doing, no matter what play, no matter what position you play, no matter where you're hitting in the lineup. It's just a number. You are still in the game. And the more that we can stay in the game, the better we're going to be on the offensive side of the game. Because it's easy to stand out there and pick roses and be – just your head in the sky and not do anything. And then the ball's hit at you, short hops in, you cost the team the game because you weren't paying attention. So always Right, like you said, if you're in the lineup, you can affect the game. Mm-hmm. So we want a bunch of people in the lineup that can affect it positively. Because once you affect it negatively, you got to go. So don't think just because you're having a bad day at the plate, you can't affect the game. You can make a game-winning catch. You can make a game-winning play defensively. And vice versa, if you're sucking in the field that day, two or three airs, booting the ball, can't, you don't have your range, you're a little sluggish, you could come up big – in the hitting. So don't ever take yourself out of the game before a coach does. Because if you take yourself mentally, you're done. And hopefully your coaches are uh, aware enough to take you out once you're defeating yourself. Because then you have to play against 10 people, not only the other team, but yourself included. Mm, That's a really tough battle. I love that. And if you guys are dealing with that mental struggle or your mindset struggle, we've got something for you. There we go. Plug it, baby. Let's do it. We can help you, baby. We can help you. Let's go. I I, I set it up, man. I told you I'm a team player. I throw the oop. Hey, I just had to dunk it. I'm shacking it. (laughs) Let's go. Jake, Adam, you guys got any more questions? Um, How do you do that, Justin? Everything you just talked about I think is awesome in regards to separating – you know, what you're doing well versus what you're struggling with on any given day. And we've talked to these guys a little bit about that, especially in week one. But what what did you do personally um, if you were struggling in one area of a game to make sure that mentally you stayed focused on on the other parts where you could have a positive impact? Um, you have to, again, you have to have a lot of confidence in your ability. And the reason why you have that confidence is because you put in the time. And the reason why you put in the time is because you want it. So it all goes back down to desire. Okay, if you want to play baseball, you will play baseball. You know why? Because you'll work towards it. And when you work towards that, you'll have the ability to play baseball. It's a big cycle. It's a big loop. I think confidence comes comes from competence, right? Like, it comes from trusting your training. And, you know, we talked about that the other day with these guys of, you know, you don't rise to an occasion. You sink to the level of your training. So, you got to train faster and harder than the game's going to be played at so that everything slows down for you when you're in that crunch time moment. So I love that. I think that's huge. And um, players, I think, I think sometimes, you know, we, we share a similar message as coaches all from different areas and different backgrounds. Um, And the way that we share that sometimes comes across in some different verbiage. So hopefully from hearing that from multiple people in just slightly different ways, Um, At least one of those ways hopefully has sunk in with you guys of of really how to move past those struggles, how to be one for one in every at bat or every defensive play, how to be confident in your prep, how to do those things. Because, you know, I'm I'm hearing a lot of similarities as we move into week four and finish up week three um, and everything that that these other guys have said, too. So um, I think it's awesome. I think it's a great message to hear. and, And, you know, that consistency that you're hearing. Um, also led to consistency in play for a lot of these guys too. So it's it's really, really important for you guys to maximize that. Yeah, like you said, like I knew I put in the time. So therefore, if I'm struggling, I'm not, I'm not freaking out because I know I can do it because I've gotten to this point. Whatever level you're at, if you know you put in the time, you're going to – you may not always do well, but you know you will get back on track because you put in the time. If you study for a test, you're going to usually do well. If you don't study for a test, you're freaking out. All right? It just makes sense. So baseball is this test. And practice is what you have to do, the homework. And if you do your homework, you do well on the test. So, yeah, you're going to have those off nights. Because, again, people get paid a lot of money to hit 300, 3 out of 10. That's not a really good average in any other profession or job or anything in life you do, 3 out of 10. But this game is so hard, so you have to also know that. So you're not going to hit 400, 500 anymore the, the higher up you guys go, kids. All right? You want to strive for that, but it's not realistic. So you have to humble yourself and not take yourself too seriously and know at the end of the day, do we win? Do we lose? Did I contribute 
or I didn't. Okay, again, short-term memory, long-term atmosphere. You had a bad day, what are we going to do tomorrow? That's the great thing about baseball. We get another day. You get to play tomorrow. And if you just keep putting the time, your confidence grows because you see it firsthand. I put in the time. I put in the sweat and tears. I'm, go I'm going to demand some, some results. And when you just hold yourself to that ability and your accountability towards your teammates and yourself, then things are growing. You start getting a team. And then they like said, even if you're having an off day, and it's like, okay, I got your back. You know why? Because I put in the same amount of time or more time than you did, Jake. And now I got your back. I'm going to help you out because you're going to help me out one day. And then when everyone's on the same page, you're unstoppable. And like I said, I always tell kids, if you believe you can't, you won't. If you believe you can, you will. Love it. That's really good. I love it, man. Well, that's guys, that's some good advice to have from a guy that's been there and done that. So take that stuff to heart. And, um, you know, I think you guys will be, you know, especially during this weird time, take that stuff to heart and make sure that you're doing the stuff to prep, to, you know, do your homework, all that kind of stuff. That's all, that's all we have time for right now. So take that stuff to heart, especially when it comes to all the fundamental stuff we're talking about with catching, with infielding, with outfielding. Anything that you see online, you know, that we provide for those drills, all that kind of stuff, make sure you're doing that prep like Justin's talking about, and you'll be ready to go once the time comes. Yep. Yeah, huge. No, Justin, thanks for coming on here, man, and just sharing some inspiration for these athletes. And I love the mental side, and I love what you mentioned about the mental side there and then how it's a mentality deal with everything you do. And you got to play with some of the best at, at Indiana and being able to be at a, a position like that to succeed at that high of a level is very, very special. And to be able to give back, get just, just knowing as athletes in this room, it's very special to have the opportunity to hear from somebody who's been on that stage. I mean, a top 10 play, which is really freaking cool. But other than that, it didn't happen overnight. It took constant years of preparation. So whether you're eight, nine, or 10 in here, or you're 18 and 17 getting ready to go to college, it's still gonna take a lot of preparation and a lot of time and a lot of discipline. And the most important factor into that, the most important emotion, like Justin said, is the desire to want it. We can want it, but we've gotta like know why we want it. We've gotta have that desire to go after it all day long. Um, so this was huge, this was huge. Um, we got two things before we're done. Two things before we're done. One, remember the shirts, if you guys want any shirts, I just put the link in the thing. Thanks Adam for sharing that over. If you want shirts, Go on there, purchase one. Totally up to you, but we have those shirts available now. You can hop on there. We'll have those going for the next week. And then two, Fern Daddy's in here, so we got to sing him happy birthday. So, <laughs> so we got to give him a little happy birthday, and I'm going to start it, and I'm going to unmute everybody if I can. Oh, 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 real quick, real quick before we go. Yeah, uh, yeah. I just wanna, oh hey, thanks for having me on, guys. I really appreciate it. Uh, like I said, players, really take this to heart, really work on it. I know you can't go outside or communicate and do all that stuff with your team right now, because of the coronavirus, but you can still work. You can still work towards your goals. You still have to have that desire. There's no excuse. This, this is actually the best time for you because you can get a lot more done. All right, if you want it and the season comes to fruition, or even next year, you will see who put in the work, who put in the time. So again, you guys have to want it, and you got to thank these coaches for letting you allow yourself to get the Zoom and read all this stuff and do all this stuff. They said not every kid has his ability. All right, or has the opportunities that you guys have. So take advantage of it. All right, really do. These guys know what they're talking about. They really invested in this, and they really want to see you guys succeed. So again, I was very fortunate to come in and help me help you guys out. I appreciate Jake, Adam, Austin, all you guys allowing me to do this. I really had a good time. And everyone, stay safe. Uh, love your families, but more importantly, like I said, be very thankful that you have guys like Austin, Jake, and Adam that are trying to help you out. We appreciate you, man. Uh, Thank you. It's also time out muting everybody. Okay. Um, it's also Chris's birthday tomorrow. So we're going to say Chris and Fern for the birthdays. Chris and Fern on three. I muted you on my call. One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. 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 Thanks for hopping on. Have a good weekend. We'll see you guys back here next week for the final week of baseball school. We're fired up. Bye, bye.
See you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Burn wins the Friday. Burn wins the Friday. Yeah, but who won the, so really who won the contest? The birthday. That was really good. <laughs>